I'll start because, yeah, it's impossible knowing how long it's going to take. I don't want to run over at all. Um, yeah, my name's John. Uh, I'm here representing Drugs and Me. We're uh, an addict. We're a harm reduction organisation that started in London. We presented at the last Breaking Con and spoke a little bit about ourselves and what we were doing. And we kind of wanted to come back and tell you guys about how we've moved on with our harm reduction message how we've been thinking about things to kind of do a better job, address communities better, and how we think harm reduction could change in some ways for a lot of the kind of grassroots uh, harm reduction organizations out there. So first, just a little bit about myself. I'm currently a medical student. Oh, is it not on the... Thanks. There we go. <laughs> Simple fix. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a medical student at King's at the moment, uh, hoping to maybe go down into psychiatry at some point. But previously I did a degree at UCL in neurophysiology and pharmacology. And while I was there, uh, some uh, other students started this organisation, Drugs and Me, where we were making use of the knowledge that we all had and the scientific literacy that we were lucky to be developing to develop some robust evidence-based evidence for people that would be freely available online. Uh, I wrote the Modafinil page, which I think study drugs tend to be not included as much in the harm reduction message, but there are definite risks there. So that was a, an interesting project, and at the moment we're working, working on one for opiates, because there's a growing problem with opiates across the world, and not just in the US, here as well. But if anybody has any questions about that or wants to see that, uh, come ask me afterwards. Or we've also got the, our talk is on, on YouTube from last year and we kind of go through some of the details of it there. But what I wanted to talk about firstly was how we think about the people that are going to be reading our guides and their, their needs in terms of harm reduction. So what we do is we, we use an ethnographic lens. So we think about them from an objective point of view about what their habits might be, what, how their culture develops, what social hierarchies might be within communities that are using substances recreationally. And that helps us kind of distance ourselves from some of the biases or assumptions that we might have. Um, we validate this in a particular way, which I'll tell you about later on. But if we think about it together a little bit, you, using some of the, the stats that are out there, uh, in the EU, roughly f just over 40 million men have used recreational substances at some point in their life, whereas it, the, it's about 32 million for women. And when you look at the numbers for uh, persistent substance use after that, that divide grows a little bit more. So you have these communities which are, uh, have a predominance of men, uh, and often it's men that are providing substances for women. You also have to, we think about how people are going to be learning about the harms that they're encountering with substances. And when you have these communities where because of the legislative environment that we have, they can only really learn from their own experience, really. And, and looking online and trying to find information and reading anecdotal reports from sites like Arrowhead, but that's not really that robust or, or, or applicable. There, there's a certain level of scientific literacy that you need to use to take that on board and so people can make false conclusions and put themselves in harm's way. And exploring some of those problems a little bit more, I've already mentioned that, that mechanism of learning uh, and that's something that we've addressed and that, that, that puts people at a distinct biological risk. If, if they're learning in ways which aren't appropriate, they may think that they're doing things which are safe, that certain dosages are appropriate, when they might not be. And with that gender bias that I mentioned, there are certain risks within substance use that do, because of the difference in biology between, uh, between sexes, if you have predominantly ma uh, male uh, individuals bring people uh, into communities, uh, inducting them, helping them, maybe giving them doses, certain things for them, they're not going to be addressing their needs. There's, there's evidence to show that depending on uh, where, which part of the ovulatory cycle a woman might be in, she may have different sensitivities to MDMA. There's also, for example, the modafinil guide that I wrote. We found that modafinil can, which is a, it's a wakefulness drug that's really quite safe, it's used a lot, but it can diminish the efficacy of the contraceptive pill. And that's not something that really people are told about, and if you're being 
sold modafinil in the back alley by a guy who doesn't take the contraceptive pill, he's not really going to know to tell you. And if you have a lot of students using it in exams, they finish exams, then go out, celebrate, maybe have unprotected sex. That's a conversation which isn't happening because of the environment that we have. And so these are the things that we're trying to address. Also biological variation, people may assume that what's safe for another person might be safe for themselves, and not experiment, get to know themselves. So by putting a lot of this information in a really structured, digestible way on Drugs and Me, we're trying to give people these principles so they can appreciate how they need to approach these things and support themselves. And yeah, we really don't treat prescription medications this way. We have so many systems in place to protect people, but because of legislation, we're, we're not able to do that. So we decided to step in as, as an external actor and, and do what we could. But all of that fits into addressing the individual's risks and what their biological kind of interactions with the drugs might be and what their risks are there. We decided to, in the last couple of years, really since we last came to Breaking Con, to, to step out from just thinking about individuals and what they're doing and how they're acting and to start working more with organisations. We, so we started at UCL and we carried out some surveys there ourselves, but recently we started working with uh, the Leeds University Union and we carried out the largest uh, survey on recreational substance use to be done within one university. We had about 3,000 respondents and that's informed a lot of what's gone behind our new brand, which is ADEC, which stands for Alcohol and Other Drug Education Consultancy. Like I've been working with universities, uh, we've also been working with some festivals, with schools throughout the UK and in Asia as well. And I just want to present to you a little bit of that data from Leeds and then take you through how that's been informing our approach and how we've changed it from a strictly, strictly kind of biological risk approach that we've had in Drugs and Me. So to start with, we, we thought we'd ask people why they take drugs. Shockingly, we found out people take drugs to have fun. Uh, what was, who'd have thought, honestly. But what we did find more interesting from, from the data was these three points there of people self-reporting uh, using substances, like, as it says on the slide, to escape reality, cope with exam and str with general stress, and managing mental health issues. So roughly 14, just under 14% of people reported that they themselves were managing a mental health issue with substances, and they were aware of that. That's likely a larger number because of the self-reporting, and that's something that we found in a similar number in our study at UCL and the National Union for Students also did a study across the country and they found roughly 20% of students reported managing mental health issues themselves. That's unlikely to be developing a positive and healthy relationship with substances for people that are using it. And if we think about what we know about addiction and other mental health issues, there's a lot of correlation there where if people with mental health issues are at greater risk for developing dependence and addiction. So this is something that we really want to address and help people to, to understand for themselves while having to work within the limitations of legislation and also resources and things like that. So we asked a little bit more about why people self-medicate and the overwhelming reasons were to reduce anxiety and to alleviate symptoms of depression. Shouldn't really surprise anybody, those are the most common mental health issues. But we also have things such as eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, PTSD. And self-medication is not an effective way to be dealing with these problems. It, it's tricky because there are so many restrictions on resources within uh, the NHS and other places at the moment where people have really struggled to be given the help that they need if they do have mental health issues. But we think that that doesn't mean that we can't help them within this to kind of develop a better relationship with substances, to maybe understand some psychological principles that might inform their relationship with them. So I've spoken a little bit about the fact that we've tried to move away from the biological. What we've been using is the biopsychosocial model, which is used very commonly in healthcare. It was developed by a psychiatrist in the 70s to kind of move away from the, the division between people looking at brain uh, brain diseases as a model rather than considering the mind and people looking at uh, 
psychiatric illnesses and mental health from this moralistic point of view of seeing it as all psychological and psychoanalytical because obviously it's multifactorial and there's a lot going on within all those different spheres that interact with each other. So it's, it's quite a simple but powerful principle and if we talk about its relevance within harm reduction it's really useful uh, we think to bear in mind that none of these factors work in isolation. Right? I'm sure many of you are familiar with set and setting as a principle in psychedelic use. Uh, you can draw parallels between set and setting to things like placebo where, and, and drug actions where expectations can have a big impact on how things uh, uh, act on you after using them. Uh, there was a study in one of the first landmark placebo studies where a doctor gave his patients who were nauseous uh, an emetic, a drug that would make them vomit, told them it was an anti-emetic, very ethical but great, uh, but found that they started vomiting less, even though he was giving them a compound which molecularly would be making them, should be making them more nauseous. But, so that's the power of the that's, uh, psychological factor coming in and that can, has obvious implications for people using recreational substances if they're coming from uh, a negative space and intending maybe using alcohol or, or something like MDMA to self-medicate, they may be expecting something different than thinking that because this compound has its properties, it will do things for them and help address their problems when it won't. Their in intrinsic point of approach is crucial for the action that it will have on them. Um, there's also, as you say, relevance to dependence. Uh, we how we interact with drugs and, and uh, how we experience the physical actions of it is really important. There are talks going on about, uh, about somatic effects and the importance that has within therapy. If you think about the ways in which dependence forms, one of the oldest uh, ideas behind it is positive and negative reinforcement paradigms, where positive reinforcement is the high that you get, which is pleasurable and that you become attached to that because it's something that you want to experience again. Whereas the negative reinforcement comes from experiencing a low or a come down and you want to experience the substance again to get away <laughs> from that feeling. When people have some understanding of that and that that's how those kind of connections are formed and they have some understanding of psychology and the, the neuroscientific principles behind it, we think, and there's some data to support this, though it's, it's, it's growing now, we think that helps people to change their relationships with substances and how it grows. And if they are on that come down, to, to understand this is a come down. It's right. And treat yourself well and move on from that. And maybe use some of the advice that we have on our Drugs and Me guide, but to have that principle instilled in their minds. Um, so off the back of changing our perspective from the biological with that, we then thought, how do we deliver this new information to students? Because that's not something which works as well being given as data, right? Their principles, their ways of thinking and approaching problems. And so when we did this uh, study, this survey with Leeds, we also asked what students were, up, were open to. And as you can see, the first couple points, non-judgmental advice on the effects of drugs and practical advice on harm reduction with respect to drugs. This is what we've attempted to cover with Drugs and Me. This is the first important step in harm reduction. And we think that that's where most harm reduction has lied for the last few years, because also it's the most feasible one to deliver in terms of resources. But when you look further down the list, you have roughly 40% of people interested in alcohol and drug education talks and activities, then interested in workshops throughout the years, and 25% of people interested in skill training, such as resistance and self-control. Now. That's quite a resource intensive uh, thing to deliver and we think absolutely universities could deliver that but at the moment they're not. They're, they seem to be quite limited in their conversations and we focus on the universities because that's our area of expertise, that's what we've explored the most and where, where we came from. But we kind of thought that we would look at with organisations to see what we could do and how we could try and instill that in different areas. So with regards to those alcohol and drug education workshops, um, ah, sorry, first just to say that yeah, we're continuing our work with universities at the moment. We're working, we'll be at um, UCL in September, delivering harm reduction workshops. We'll be in Paris, still working with Leeds and there's a couple of other universities that we're talking to. But as I was saying with the other organisations that we've been working with, we worked with a, a festival called Ibiza Rocks 
and kind of worked with them on providing some campaign messaging, uh, some simple things. But what was more interesting that we did with them was we went and we gave workshops to their staff there and gave them some information on how to approach people if you do somebody, see somebody that's having a, a negative experience that is maybe experiencing paranoia and how to approach them depending on whether they're experiencing paranoia triggered by stimulants or maybe from a psychedelic and what the most appropriate responses are there and how we can then afterwards provide aftercare for individuals. Because in this kind of setting, it's difficult to deliver information to all those individuals, but by helping the organization change around them, we can modify some of those social factors and help create a better environment so that all of those three elements, the bio, the psycho and the social, can maybe not be quite as disposed towards harm as they tend to be because of the uh, legislation that we have. And we're also doing as much, we've been working with a lot of schools throughout the UK. Why wait until university? Uh, if people are looking for skill training and things like resistance and self-control, we can maybe help instill principles with them earlier on. And using, doing things over time, they have a lot more weight, a lot more psychological value. So we've been running workshops with uh, schools like Brampton Manor and East Ham and some schools in the north uh, on using scenarios to give people kind of direct basic principles that they can understand about what the importance of these things might be. And for example, going through how somebody might approach uh, using a psychedelic or something like MDMA, what their f how they can kind of have uh, an internal dialogue about what the reasons are for it with their friends, understand the factors acting on them, and then talk about a uh, post-use environment where after using the substance, how they can care for themselves, understand the relationship to the substance, and avoid developing negative relationships with them. Uh, what we're doing now, which we're really excited about, and if anybody's interested in it, um, I am happy to talk about it afterwards, but we're developing a curriculum with a school in Asia, starting from year seven up to year 13, where we're starting off talking about basic principles that students are being taught in biology and chemistry, such as percentage by volume and things like that, so they can understand doses and, and starting from that concept and teaching them about things like giving them a little bit more of a wider view of the neuroscience behind uh, a lot of these substances to then build up on that so that by the time that they graduate they have uh, an informed view of substances rather than what is the case in a lot of these Asian schools, a zero tolerance policy that has no conversation about it because these countries tend to have really strict laws and be really uh, punitive towards them. And a lot of the schools have the approach that we're not even going to give them an abstinence message because we assume and expect and have to hold to the idea that none of our students use substances. And then a lot of these students then do go abroad and uh, end up in places like the UK or in, in the Netherlands where there are more uh, relaxed controls and, and some decriminalization and having no basis or preparation on which to build this relationship with substances. So that's what we've been doing at the moment. Uh, we're working with more and more universities, as I was saying, and, uh, and with some festivals and with the schools. The, the education is something that we're really passionate about. But we really want to be moving on from what harm reduction has been doing for the last few years, just focusing on that biological and trying to teach those slightly more complex psychological principles to people to give them an understanding so that they feel uh, a little bit more comfortable in what they're doing and in themselves and being able to look after themselves and others if they do choose to use, use drugs. So this is uh, our team uh, enjoying a great curry in Tayabs after uh, kind of our launch of ADEC. Uh, if anybody uh, wants to get in contact with us, those are uh, it's my personal email and the uh, email for our organisation. We're really excited to be working with a lot of different people throughout London and the UK at the moment. And if anybody wants to see some more of our data as well, we'd be happy to share.